Look at this. I will send a request to the application and simulate failure or upgrade or any other similar action by deleting the pod where the application is running. Since we initialized the delete process before the server returned a response, we got 502 bad gateway message. The application was deleted before it could respond and I, the user of that application, failed to get what I'm looking for. That's a horrible experience that could have been improved by enabling the application to shut down gracefully. Here's the question. How do we kill something gracefully? How do we make sure that when your application is destroyed, the users of that application do not experience any downtime and not a single request is lost? Now, you might be thinking, that's easy. Just do not delete any application. That's close to impossible though, since there are myriad of reasons why an application, or to be more precise, a replica of an application would be destroyed, gone, deleted, removed, whatever you want to call it. When we upgrade applications, we tend to create new replicas based on a new release and destroy the old ones. When we scale the cluster, some replicas of the application might be destroyed and created elsewhere. A node where uh, an application is running might need to be upgraded, resulting in replicas running in it being moved somewhere else, since node upgrades often means destroy the old one and create a new one. There are many, many, many reasons why a replica of an application might be deleted. It's a matter of when rather than if. Today we are going to discuss how we can make our applications fail gracefully. How to ensure that when a replica is deleted, our users are not affected in any form or way. To make the discussion more interesting, I'll propose a solution that works anywhere. I will show a way how to shut down gracefully, no matter whether the application is running directly in a server, or is managed by Docker, or is running in Kubernetes, or almost any other permutation we might imagine. The solution to the problem we are trying to solve today is called Signals. Most of the systems, especially those based on Linux, which is the vast majority, are all assuming that applications are capable of receiving different signals and act accordingly. The only problem is that many of us are not aware of them. That's going to change today. Let me run a silly application locally first. It already knows how to handle signals we'll be discussing, but first I want to show how it would work if it would be a normal application oblivious that there is such a thing as signals. I'll do that by setting no signals environment variable since the code skips implementing signals if that variable is set. From there on, I will just execute go run. Now, before we proceed, I have to mention two things. First, my application is written in Go, but that should be relevant since the same logic can be added to any language. Second, I'm using Zellige as terminal multiplexer with two panes. If you're not familiar with Zellige, you might want to check that video over there. Now let's get back to the subject at hand. I will send a request to calculate Fibonacci number. That will take a bit of time, which is great since it will give us the opportunity to see easier what's happening. Next, I will simulate application removal by pressing Ctrl C to stop the server and the CURL command failed to get the response. When I stopped the server, that action was performed almost instantly, so the process that was calculating Fibonacci number did not have time to finish and to return the response. Now, let's take a look at how the application should behave in those circumstances by executing go run again, but this time without the environment variable that tells it to ignore signals coming from the operating system. Let's send the same request again and shut down the server. Here's the difference. This time, the application did not shut down right away. Instead, it waited until all ongoing requests are served and only then it shut itself down. That's why we got back the response with the calculated Fibonacci number before the application was annihilated. How did that happen? What is the code that enabled the application to shut itself down gracefully? Here it goes. As I mentioned earlier, the code is written in Go, but that should not scare you if you're not proficient with it, since this is more about the principles you can implement in any language than actual showcase of how to do it in Go. 
If environment variable no signals is set, the application starts a normal web server that listens and serves requests. The second case, the one inside the else statement is how we should interpret signals. The server is started just as before, but this time in a separate thread. It will work indefinitely or until we shut down the application. When we do try to shut down the app, like I did earlier by pressing Ctrl C or by executing kill command or in almost any other way, the system does not just kill the application. Instead, it sends interrupt or terminate signals. That is happening independently of how we write our code. And now comes the important part. After sending one of those signals, the system waits for a response that it is safe to destroy it. If nothing catches those signals, shutdown is immediate. But that's not the case here. Over there, we are capturing those signals and telling the server to shut itself down gracefully, which can be interpreted as stop processing upcoming requests, finish those that are ongoing, and then die. Here's what happened so far. At the beginning, there was a laptop and the developer said, let there be an app. And there was an app. And the developer said, let there be a request. And there was a request. However, soon afterwards, the developer in its ultimate wisdom said, kill the app. And the server sent the interrupt signal to the app. That signal can be interpreted as, I'm about to kill you. How do you feel about that? The app said nothing. It stopped receiving new requests and continued processing existing requests. Once finished, it responded to the developer. Once all the requests were processed, it chose to break the silence. It stopped ignoring the server and said, it's okay. I'm ready to comply with your request and die with honor. That's what the server needed. It got app's consent to annihilate it. The app is no more. It died gracefully on its own terms. The app could not avoid that, but it could postpone it until it felt the time was right to perish. All that is nice and good, but you might be thinking that it is useless. While many of us might run applications like that locally, they're often packaged into images and running in containers in production. Hence the question is, how do we do the same in containers? Can we implement something similar with, let's say, Docker. I already have a container image with the binary based on the code we ran earlier. Let's run it and see what we'll get. Just as before, we'll send a request to the app, this time running as a Docker container, expecting to get a Fibonacci number. Next, we'll shut down the Docker container and... Nope, it's the same problem. The container was shut down before the application running in it managed to respond. Let's run the container again, but this time without the no signals variable so that the code can work with signals in the same way as we experienced before. And before we continue, there is an important note. There is nothing in that image that specifies how should containers handle sig term and other signals. It's just a normal Docker file that contains the binary based on the code we saw earlier. In other words, there is nothing, absolutely nothing special about it. Here it goes. We'll run the Docker container, send the request to it, and stop the container before the request was processed. We can observe that the container is not being shut down right away. Instead, it is waiting for something. It sent a sick term signal to the main process inside the container, and now it is waiting for it to respond. A few moments later, we can see that the HTTP response arrived first, and that the container was deleted afterwards. So, Here's what happened. We have a server with Docker. Actually, it's a laptop with Docker, but the story is still the same. We send a request to Docker telling it to run a container and then we send a request to the application inside that container to calculate a Fibonacci number. The app started working. It started calculating the number. However, in the middle of that process, we sent another request to Docker. We told it to kill the container. Docker, however, is not an asshole. It's a, he's a nice guy who does not just kill. Instead, it talked to the container and said, look, I was told to kill you. I don't like it any more than you do. Is that okay? Do you have any last minute things you would like to do before I chop you to pieces? That wasn't the real conversation, but my interpretation of it. In reality, Docker is not that talkative. Instead, it follows the rules of any Nix system. So it sent a single word to the container. It said, sick term or sigint. Actually, even that is not correct. 
Docker did not send anything to the container, but to the main process inside the container, which in this case is the application we explored earlier. That application did not respond right away, but stopped receiving requests, continued working on all its pending tasks, responded to the request and only then went back to Docker and said, you know what? Okay, I'm ready to die now. Kill me. As you can see, the world out there is violent, but it follows the same rules, at least so far. It does not matter whether we are running the code directly or we are running it inside containers. Whenever we choose to kill something, sick term or sigint signals are sent to it. It does not matter why something should be killed. It could be because we don't want it anymore or because we want to replace all the release with a new one or because we are moving processes from one server to another or for any other reason. Killing is inevitable and we just need to choose whether it should be instant or graceful. Now, how about Kubernetes? How can we accomplish the same in our clusters? Let's run the application based on the same code and the same container image, but this time inside a Kubernetes cluster. We'll do that with Timoni, mostly because the manifests in the current repo are being defined as Q. Don't worry if you're not familiar with Timoni, it just generates YAML files and the result would be the same with Helm, customize KCL or anything else. If you're curious about Timoni, you might want to watch that video over there. Just don't do it right away, don't do it now, it's not necessary for this subject. Next, we'll send a similar request uh, to calculate a Fibonacci number and delete the pods and observe that nothing happened right away. The pod was not deleted right away. Instead, Kubernetes followed the same rules and sent the SIGTERM signal to the main process inside the container, which is inside the pods. Right before it did that, it stopped sending new requests to that specific pod. The application in turn finished processing all ongoing requests, responding back with the number and only then went back to Kubernetes saying, I'm ready to die. Goodbye. Now, to be clear, such a situation rarely happens in Kubernetes. Typically, we would have multiple replicas of the application, so killing one pod would mean that Kubernetes stops sending requests to it while it keeps going with the others. There should be no interruption to the service since other pods keep serving new requests, while the one that is being killed is given time to respond to ongoing requests before it gets killed. Similarly, if you would upgrade an application in Kubernetes, new pods would be created first, and start handling new requests while the old pods are finishing whatever they need to do before they're killed. What matters is that SIGTERM and SYNGINT works everywhere and that there is nothing we should do to make it work but a few lines of code inside the application. There are no changes to Dockerfile, no changes to Kubernetes manifests or anywhere else. All the tools should be aware how Nix works and comply with it. Today, that compliance means that SIGTERM signals are always sent to the main process before it gets deleted. It's up to us to ensure reception and handling of those signals. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Cheers.